Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 1310. Um, this is evidence and proof. We're into week eight. And this week we're marching or continuing to march through the material. So I'm behind uh, in terms of the, the reading. But I do ask you to keep on top of the reading and stay ahead of the Zoom sessions. And we will progressively catch up. So we're at the stage now where we need to consider the examination. And the difficulty that I have in an examination setting is that we have a limited time. I must confess that my preference, if I was to examine you the way I'd like, would be to have an online examination with a period of time, completely open book, and with full access to internet and other resources. Now, we can't do that, so you've got the uh, invigilated examination. Um, the exam will be very similar in style to the examinations fairly recently provided. And um, uh, it's been a while since I wrote the exam, so I honestly can't say what's in it. But um, I do know it's of similar style. So the best thing I can suggest to you is to look at past exams. I believe that I've uploaded a number of those onto Moodle and most definitely have an answer to each of those exam questions. And you may find that the examination this term includes some questions that are at least similar to some of those uh, questions that have been asked in the past. So good luck with your preparation. Remember, of course, that uh, you can take in any materials that you like to the examination. You can't access the internet, so, um, but you can have answers pre-written in relation to various questions. Um, I like to, uh, I'd like to encourage you to look at the video that I prepared a little while ago uh, called Level 3 Preparation for Exams and Short Term um, or Short uh, Window um, Online uh, Papers. So that will give you a good idea as to how I think you best prepare. And Level 4, which I don't talk about in the video, is where you have the answers available to you for other subjects. So, for example, if you're dealing with a contract matter or constitutional admin, whatever it might be, there may be elements of evidence law that are built into those questions. And whilst they may not be directly accessible, you can always introduce something from evidence law into any answers that you give in other units of the, um, the, de the degree where relevant. The other thing that is sometimes overlooked and that I think is very important is to ensure that you at least consider ethical obligations and rules in relation to answering any question, whether that's evidence and proof or any other legal question that you might be dealing with. And from an examiner's perspective, I'm confident in saying that we will always be very pleased to see some commentary in relation to ethical issues. Now, you don't need to force the issue, but make sure that you have the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, the Barrister's Rules available, and you can refer to those in appropriate circumstances. All right, any questions about the examination regime? And bearing in mind, I will go into much more detail in week 10. The other thing I should mention is that uh, this week, I believe, is the start of the feedback um, exercise. Uh, given that you're in, uh, prim primarily in third year doing this unit, I'm sure you're all aware of the feedback regime. The big red button, top left-hand corner of Moodle page, please have your say. The feedback that you provide is very valuable and important for me and for the university generally, and we look to provide you with quality uh, resources and materials. So please um, uh, anonymously complete that uh, feedback, and I'd certainly appreciate it. Okay, um, the question here is, do you want us to take the barrister's rule into the exam? Yeah, it's very, it's very thin, the barrister's rule, um, 2011, amended in 2016, and um, I'd certainly take that in. Um, and I believe the exam is only two hours, Elise, yes. So two hours. I don't know the date yet. You may be able to access that information soon enough from the My CQU site. Um, or wherever it is that you normally go um, for accessing. And I'm told that it's the 14th of February in the afternoon. Now, thank you very much, Sarah. That may vary for different students. And of course, it's um, necessary for you to fully understand the time and the location for your examination. 
I think the university intends to have the examinations commence at the same time for everyone. But of course, we do have some people that live not only in different states, but also overseas. So um, that can always be a bit different. Um, so I think it's two hours. Um, the university generally, and I hope I'm not talking out of, out of turn here, resolve that examinations that are invigilated should be two hours, not three hours. And um, I support that approach. Three hours is a very long time. It's very taxing. But of course, in writing the examination, I need to take that into account. So I think that the examination, well, certainly the exams that I write are tailored for a two hour window rather than three. The um, importance then of being pre-prepared is critical. And again, have a look at that video and um, that I've referred to, level three preparation. If you have any feedback about that video, if you disagree with what I say in it, please let me know. And I'm always um, keen to speak about those sorts of issues. Preparation is important in practice as well. So what you've probably noticed in evidence and proof is the importance of being able to think on your feet and have an answer immediately. So having a short examination window and being well prepared simply puts you in a better position in practice um, when it comes to evidence and proof issues. So as you would have seen from the um, initial assessment, um, the examination, cross-examination exercise, you need to be able to think on your feet. Um, if we had expanded that further to go into objections, then even more so where you, you know there's something wrong, you object and immediately the judge or the magistrate says on what basis. And it's at that time that you need to produce a section or a case or both to support your argument. We all know, of course, that the vibe is not uh, going to get you very far in real life as an argument. Okay, um, so let's talk, continue on where we were discussing. The general rule is that people give their evidence in open court from their own memory. Oral evidence, gold standard. But sometimes the courts will relax that rule and allow people to look at some document that they have, may have prepared. But there needs to be, there must be a need for that person to, as it were, refresh their memory from a document that they had prepared. It's not something that is as of right. And um, there must be good reason given for the need to refresh their memory. And the document uh, must have been completed personally, or at least verified by that person, at the time that the facts were recorded, while matters were fresh in the witness's memory. We call that, if you like, contemporaneous. Police are very well accustomed to, if you like, and for want of a better term, rattling off a good reason why they need to refresh their memory from a contemporaneous document, such as police notebook. And um, that really comes down to the accuracy of the evidence. So if um, the conditions are satisfied, the court will, in certain circumstances, allow a person to look at a document to refresh their memory, even though they're in the witness box and they're giving oral evidence. Now, of course, the, it's the, almost always, it is the oral evidence that is the testimony, the evidence which is presented to the court, rather than the document itself. But there are uh, a few exceptions, and you've probably noticed this with evidence law. It's so much um, a case consistently of saying, here's the rule, but there are exceptions. And uh, it reminds me of that old, I don't know, it's anecdote or joke about the client wanting to pay more for a lawyer with only one hand, because clients get very tired of lawyers who say, here's the legal situation, but on the other hand, here's what might happen. So they really want someone who's just got the one hand. They don't like the other hand solution, but it's very hard to avoid. The rule in Walker and Walker is one that comes to mind. It's an old case from the High Court, 1937, 57 CLR 30. Um, it's to do with the documentation. So a party can call for production of a document from another party in circumstances where that other party refers to a document. And if the second party 
Um, so if the first party calls for production, if party A calls for production of a document from party B, then party B may insist on the entire document going into evidence. And this is the important point, and this is the rule in Walker and Walker, as evidence of the truth of its contents. Now, having said that, the rule was abolished under the Commonwealth Uniform Evidence Act, Section 35, but it still applies in Queensland. It doesn't apply when party A, the one calling for production, simply cross-examines the witness for party B on those parts of the document used by the witness to refresh their memory. But if counsel for party A goes beyond that, then the rule in Walker and Walker does apply and the whole document goes in, and this is the important part, as evidence of truth of its contents. In criminal law, that really should be academic because prosecution is under a duty of disclosure and that's a statutory duty. So please bear in mind that uh, general obligation for prosecution. Now, if you'd like, the rule in Walker and Walker is one exception. Another one that comes to mind is the fact that um, sometimes a witness may be entirely credible and the evidence provided highly cogent, but the witness may have no independent recollection of certain events. So you can picture a, a doctor, for example, in a busy casualty ward. The doctor might be utterly convinced that the medical record produced by that doctor is totally accurate, but in response to a direct question, the doctor may say, I have no, absolutely no independent recollection of that event, but I'm looking at my notes and I'm absolutely convinced that what I've written there is correct and that the court can rely upon the facts that I've recorded in that note. So once the document has been suitably authenticated, then the court may admit that document into evidence and in those circumstances in effect it's the content of the document that replaces the evidence of the doctor because the doctor has no oral evidence of any note to give. So even though we're saying that oral evidence is the gold standard, oral evidence is that upon which people are in, um, will rely, there are certain circumstances where documents can be produced if those documents were contemporaneous, there's a need. Um, uh, but remember, of course, the rule in Walker and Walker complicates things a little bit. I hope that was not too difficult to understand or follow. It's a tricky area. And I'm not, this is not necessarily an exam hint, but you need to sort of work through that a bit and have some notes that work for you in relation to that issue. Uh, hostile witnesses. Now, Someone who gives evidence which is not as the person who called that um, witness hoped to, it to be is necessary, necessarily hostile. In other words, if you call as the plaintiff, if you call someone an eyewitness to give evidence and the evidence is not really what you thought that person would say, that does not automatically make the person hostile or as we call them adverse witness. Their evidence may not come up to proof. It may not be what you'd hoped for, but that doesn't mean that they're adverse witness, that's an adverse or hostile witness. There are certain circumstances where you as the counsel may attack the credit of your own witness, but it's very limited and you'll need at least leave of the court um, if you wish to refer to a statement made by that person previously, um, which is contrary to the testimony that they're giving at the time. So in that regard, have a look at the Evidence Act Queensland sections 17, 18 and 19. And at the Commonwealth, the Uniform Evidence Act, have a look at section 38. Section 19 is interesting because it talks about the issue of cross-examination. So 17 and 18, um, well, 17 certainly relates to the extent to which you can attack your own witness. Section 18 relates to both and section 19 relates to the process of cross-examining an opponent's witness. 
and a witness may be cross-examined as to a written statement without being shown that written statement, but in fairness, the subject matter of the um, content that you're cross-examining upon must be uh, explained to that person. All right, um, very technical stuff so far, but I hope that you're following. Make sure that you've considered um, at least those sections. Cross-examination. There are really two things that in, people seek to do in cross-examination. And those of you that were um, taking the role of defence in the uh, first exercise would have been looking to ask questions to do one of two things. Now, just to get your mind thinking and your fingers working, um, or you can unmute your microphone, can you tell me the two main purposes for cross-examination? What to are the cast, two? Yes, Angela? To cast doubt on what the other side was accusing your client of? Yes, correct. So that's in general terms, correct. But to cast doubt in relation to what two things? But you're right, it's cast doubt, but it really comes down to what type of evidence are you seeking to attack? Michael says to create some reasonable doubt, yes. Defence in criminal proceedings, always looking to do that. Elise says credibility, yes, that's one of them. What's the other one? You're looking to ask questions that reduce or weaken, weaken the credibility and the, the weight. The weight is something else, yep. Probative value is another one. So we're getting some really good phrases coming through here. But I'll let you know what I'm thinking. And sometimes, of course, when people ask a question, they're asking a question with something in mind, as I'm doing now. Consistency, says Elise. Yes, that's another good term as well. These are really good terms to jot down for um, an examination uh, process as well. But I think when you're cross-examining, what you're looking to do is essentially reduce or weaken, number one, the credibility of the witness. But also, you're looking to do a positive thing, and that is establish valuable facts in favour of your client. So the first one relates to attacking the credit or credibility of the witness, but at the same time, you're looking to do this positive thing of extract, extracting valuable information or facts from that party that go to the issues. So that's what I was really looking for. It's both the attack and the extraction of the positive. <clears throat> but when you're cross-examining, there are limits, of course. And counsel cannot harass or bully a witness in cross-examination or subject them to offensive or embarrassing questions that have no real relevance to the, to the case or the, the, the proper case. In Queensland, look at the Evidence Act, Section 21. Section 21 is always the starting point when considering the issue of improper questions. And the court can intervene. The court can disallow a question put to a witness in cross-examination or say to a witness, you don't have to answer that. And the test is whether is simply whether the court considers it to be an improper question. So when we look at section 21... Would that have to be through an objection first, or you mean... No, not necessarily, but normally it would be. That's a good question, Michael. Not necessarily. The court can intervene and would probably do that in circumstances where the other side is self-represented. But where the um, parties are represented, self-defending, says Michael, yes. But where the parties are represented, particularly by counsel, then there is an expectation that counsel or solicitor advocate will object. So normally it's on objection, yes. What that means then is that when you consider Section 21 and the whole issue of improper questions, you need to look at it from the perspective of being the person asking the questions, but also being the person who is sitting and listening to the opponent's questions. Number one, don't ask the question if you're the questioner. Number two, 
be ready to pounce, for want of a better term, if you are the one that um, should be objecting to a question. And it's really broad. So the question is uh, the, whether or not this is an improper question. Now, how broad is that? So how does a court decide whether a question is improper? Section 21 provides some answers. And firstly, it says, whilst we provide some guidance, we're not going to um, stifle the ability of the court to make determinations in this regard. But we will certainly, the court will certainly consider the capacity and abilities of the witness in that regard. So the witness's mental, intellectual, physical impairment will all have a bearing on this. Um, we'll also consider the witness's age, education, level of understanding, cultural background, or relationship to parties. So when it comes to determining the question of whether something is improper or not, the primary emphasis is on the person being asked the question. So the same question might be proper to one witness, but totally improper to another witness, depending on the witness's personal circumstances. So look at section 21 in that regard. So what is an improper question? Well, it's a question that uses inappropriate language, or it's misleading, or it's confusing, annoying, harassing, intimidating, offensive, oppressive, or repetitive. So what we need to do in practice is we have to have this sheet with these words right in front of us so that when we jump to our feet and we say objection, improper question, you will know that within almost a millisecond, the judge will say on what basis, and then you look at the words and you say, and you select one or more. And you might on your feet say, the question is misleading. The question is oppressive. The question is harassing. It's intimidating. So that's why you must be well prepared when it comes to the advocacy component when looking at section 21. Now, from a Commonwealth jurisdictional level, the Uniform Evidence Act, have a look at section 41, and it's fairly consistent with what's contained in the Queensland Act, section 21. My apologies for those of you in jurisdictions other than Queensland, you'll need to look at your own evidence and act in that regard. And uh, can I just say that in general terms, I do want you to make this unit as practical to you as possible. So unless the question that I ask you in an examination or assessment specifically says Queensland, um, if it's apparent to you that it relates to a state or territory that is non-Commonwealth, then feel free to answer the question from the perspective of your own state or territory. I hope that's not too confusing. But the intention is, whilst I'm teaching primarily Queensland and Commonwealth evidence law, please tailor this to your own circumstances so it's as useful as possible. So when we're talking about improper questions, part of it is this question of dealing with adverse witnesses or hostile witnesses. Now, remember, of course, that when you're cross-examining an opponent's witness, that person is not, if you like, adverse um, because they're saying something inconsistent with something they'd said earlier. It's only adverse or hostile if it's your own witness that you're um, concerned about. If it's the opponent and they say something in the witness box that is different to what they had previously said, that's great fodder for you as counsel. And you can certainly put those questions in cross-examination. You don't need the leave of the court to ask those sorts of questions and challenge the evidence which is being given as you would if it was your own witness. I hope that makes sense. So how do we deal with this issue of previous inconsistent statements by, for example, an accused person. If we're dealing with, say, inconsistent statements by a complainant, um, let's say in a sexual um, assault matter, we can say, well, you're saying that in the witness box now, but in your statement 
of this date, you said something different. And many of you picked up on that in the first exercise. Or it may be that on a previous occasion, say in a committal, the witness said something else. Uh, you can refer to the fact that on a certain day, the court, the, the witness said something else. There's no problem with that. But what about a previous inconsistent statement by an accused? Well, firstly, of course, does an accused have to give evidence in a criminal trial? Yes, no. We'll click on the buzzer. We'll see who's in first. No. No, says Michael. Of course, Eve says no. We all know that. But the accused may choose to give evidence. What happens if the accused gives evidence in circumstances where that evidence is different to what the accused had said, for example, to police on an early occasion? That opens up for hearsay. Hearsay? Oh. Is it hearsay? Maybe. Maybe. But let's say... <clears throat> Um, the police, let's say the accused gives an interview and says, I'm not guilty, um, and says, here are the facts, A, B, C. Um, what if in the witness box, the accused chooses to give evidence and says, well, here are the facts, D, E, F. It's different to A, B, C. Is the prosecutor, now I've already said that the defence counsel can attack a prosecution witness where they have the prosecution witness has made a previous inconsistent statement. There's no problem with that at all. You don't lead leave of the court, it's open slather. But does it work in reverse? Can the prosecutor attack the evidence of the accused on the basis that the accused gave a prior inconsistent statement at an earlier time? Any thoughts? I'll give you a hint. It's, it's a question of fairness. Angela, any thoughts? I know where you're going with it, but I don't know the answer. You're talking about splitting the case and in what circumstances exactly. you do that, but I don't know I when you can and can't. Exactly. I'm talking about splitting the case, and Sarah says yes, but maybe. But you're absolutely right. I'm getting to this issue of the Crown splitting its case. And the, the general answer is the Crown can't split its case. Look, have a look at the case of R against Soma, S-O-M-A. It's 2003, 212 CLR 299. So what happened in this case was Soma was convicted of rape following a trial. The Crown decided not to include a statement that Soma had given to investigating officers as part of its prosecution case. Now, Soma gave evidence, and the evidence that Soma gave was contrary to what he'd said to police. Now, Crown Counsel, the prosecution, played relevant portions of the police interview tape to the jury, and essentially was saying, Soma is lying because it, what he told you in the witness box is quite different to what he had said to police, and here's the evidence to that effect. Now, on appeal, the High Court said, no, no, you can't do that because what you've actually done is you've split your case in this way. You see, when prosecution presents its case, the general obligation is it needs to present everything that it believes is probative against the defendant. And the issue was one of fairness to the defence. And the issue was... When you come to defend something, you do so after the prosecution has put its case fairly and fully to the jury. Only then will the defence be called upon to decide whether the defence is going to give or call evidence. In this case of Soma, because the Crown chose not to play that interview tape initially, they were precluded effectively from playing it later, even though it contradicted what Soma said, because it was essentially introduced, the Crown was introducing new evidence. It's a fine line. And many people would say, but that's not fair. Um, from a defence perspective, the answer is, well, if you thought it was important, prosecutor, Mr. Prosecutor or Madam Prosecutor, 
then you should have led that as part of your evidence. You could have, but you chose not to. Does that make Sorry. sense? So just a question on that then. So if you were in the case of prosecution, then in every single case, you'd want to play that record of interview, like make everyone sit through it, even though you think the person's going to agree to it so that you don't have this problem? Yeah, it's, it's a really good practical question. And I can tell you from, from a practical perspective, many interviews that are provided by def defence to police are not played by prosecution because um, the ones that the prosecution will play are the ones where there might be some form of confession or admission or clear um, error, if, for want of a better term, a neutral term, which they would say is um, consistent with, with guilt. You know, this person is lying. They've, they've lied to the police. We're playing this interview tape, not because we believe what he said is true, but we're playing it because we said that what he's saying is lies because we've got other witnesses that say quite the opposite and we can prove that he's lying. So the police will pay, play the tape if it um, provides a confession or some form of admission or it, it is, can be useful for the Crown to show that this person is lying. But if it's a straightforward, I'm not guilty, I didn't do it um, type interview, then most of the time the Crown won't play it on the basis that it's self-serving. You see, um, so th and that that's where Soma's case makes it very difficult for the prosecution then to decide what do I put in, what do I not put in, and the answer, Angela, in practice is um, it, it it depends on the circumstances. So there's no hard and fast rule. So the Crown is not allowed to split its case. The leading authority there, Soma is the one that you would refer to in an examination question. However, here I am, I'm, on the other hand, um, the Crown may have a right of reply. Have a look at the case of Shaw against the Crown, 1953-85 CLR 365. The High Court said the Crown may be allowed a right of reply to evidence that is led by defence that could not reasonably have been anticipated by the Crown. Now that probably doesn't apply so much now because the law has changed since 1953 so that there are some positive obligations on defence to advise or alert prosecution of certain types of defences that they might otherwise wish to run. A classic example of that is alibi. So um, if defence intend to give evidence of alibi or call evidence relating to alibi, they must give prior notice, they must give the details to prosecution and allow prosecution to check it out, essentially, uh, to, to determine whether it's true or not. So when we talk about defence being under not, no obligation to give any statement, that's not entirely true. So, for example, the defence of alibi represents a, an exception to that general rule. Am I confusing you completely or are you staying with me? Because I'd like you to be able to stay with me on this. All good? Let's go on to something which is very typically still there. Good. You'll see very often in examination questions about evidence, the rule in Brown and Dunn. B-R-O-W-N-E and Dunn, D-U-N-N. So this is Brown v. Dunn. Don't worry about reading the case, to be honest. It was in 1894. The case itself is not particularly relevant, but the rule established in that case is very relevant. It still applies both in civil and criminal cases. Do we all know, you don't have to tell me what it is, you can if you like, but do we all know what the rule of Brown and Dunn is? Do we know what it says? Angela? It's like the anti-climax to law and order. You have to put it to someone that you've got um, an alternate theory. So it yes. can't be a surprise at the end. It's, yes, that's right. Not the gotcha. I'm not familiar with the show Law and Order. I know it exists, but I've never seen it. But I, I understand what you're getting at. Yes. And uh, a lot of the movies had that gotcha moment. So Brown and Dunn establishes the rule that before you can ask the court or the jury to reject the evidence of a witness called by the other party, 
or even lead evidence that's contrary to that, you must, in fairness, put certain things to the original witness and give them a fair opportunity to reject or comment on what that other party is going to allege when it's their turn. So that applies to criminal and civil. So again, we see, to some degree, a further erosion on the general rule that defence may remain mute um, before it's their turn. Because isn't there, yes, Mark. Um, isn't there a, some form of exception on that that if I gain some information today and my court case is tomorrow through a subpoena or something like that, then that would have to change. No, the general rule still applies. Are you saying that just because you found something in uh, some information late that you don't have to comply with Brown and Dunn? I'm saying that if you found it late, how do you hand it to them? Oh, okay, no, that's, that's fine. Um, so that's a good point about subpoenas. So in practice, for example, if you're running a case, um, you may wish to subpoena the records of, I don't know, the Department of Child Safety and those subpoenaed records turn up in a box and quite often they're, they're inspected on the day of the hearing. So yes, information can come late. But I think the general rule still applies. And the general rule is this, that if you're party B and you are going to give some evidence or call some evidence which is um, important, goes to the issues of the matter, then you've got to at least give the witnesses for party A a chance to comment upon that. So um, an example is this. If you have a witness who is an expert, who is going to, then you, and your party B, and you're going to call that expert evidence, and you've already read the expert report for party A, and you think, this is not right, we don't believe any of this. The general rule is that when you cross-examine the expert for party A, you've got to put some things to that expert to say, you know, we would suggest to you that um, this is the current uh, professional opinion on this aspect. You know, do you know what I mean? Now, that actually occurred in a case of Smith against Advanced Electrics, PDYLTD 2051 QDR 65. I think it's in your text. So the Court of Appeal found that counsel breached the rule by following to cross-examine a psychiatrist. And they held that if the science, the evidence was to be rejected based on other material, the psychiatrist should have been given an opportunity to comment on the evidence that was going to be produced later by the opponent so that the psychiatrist had a chance to say, that's all very well, but... Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Michael? Sort of. It's, the reason I bring it up is, well, I'm going through a case now and one of the lawyers said that you can subpoena it and you've got that in your pocket if it comes up. So, you know, cause we say general rule, is general rule 100% rule, black and white? Pretty much, yeah. Um, so just, I mean... It's, I mean, I'm WA, but I doubt there's a difference in this, so... Not much, not in the criminal jurisdiction. This Queensland civil, and WA... Oh, civil, is it? Yeah, um, WA and Queensland are pretty close. in they terms are, yeah. Of, yeah, the way that um, uh, they, they look at the law. So, yeah, no, I, I tread very carefully in that yeah. way. Again, without knowing the precise circumstances. But, no, the rule, rule in Brown and Dunn still applies, I think, from what you've said. Um... Sarah says, can you call the same witness multiple times over the course of a prolonged period? Um, generally, you only get to call a witness once in a particular trial. So um, there's not usually an opportunity to recall that witness. However, that is a very convenient segue into the discussion about the consequences that might flow from a breach in the rule of Brown and Dunn, because one of those consequences may be an opportunity to recall a witness so that counsel can actually do what they should have done at the first instance. The most severe sanction, the most severe consequence for a breach of Brown and Dunn is a refusal to admit that evidence contradicting 
the witness who was not properly cross-examined. But that's pretty rare. Usually, the court will allow some leniency and indeed, as far as a jury is concerned, to explain why the rule is there, but also, even though there was a breach, that the, that the jury can overlook that. Um, now, coming back to Sarah's question, the reason I ask is to say, if the witness calls in day one, but you find new evidence to contradict them on day three, can you call them back and fulfill the role? And that might actually go to Michael's question as well about finding new evidence late in the trial. Yeah, in those circumstances, it, it probably would be appropriate and necessary to attempt to recall that witness. We don't often find situations where there's new evidence on day three of a trial, but it can happen. That's true. Can anyone tell me where they might look for an authoritative statement as to both the rule in Brown and Dunn and some statement about the consequences of counsel failing to fulfil his or her obligations when it comes to the rule in Brown and Dunn? Elise is right onto it. Bench books. So often a resource that I encourage you to consider. Um, a little while ago, it was in Queensland, Bench Book 32. It might still be, but bear in mind the bench book numbers change. So if I tell you it's Bench Book 32 um, and it's different, that means it's changed in the last six months or so since I um, last looked. So in pre preparing for a trial, the court will explain that sometimes solicitors and barristers are busy. Sometimes there's misinformation. Sometimes under the pressure of a trial, counsel might simply forget to put a question to a witness in order to fulfill the obligations in Brown and Dunn. Um, so don't necessarily draw inferences against the defendant if defendant's counsel fails to comply with the rule in Brown and Dunn. Um, if there's no other reasonable explanation for the failure. Obviously, it's not something as counsel you want to happen. You want to put everything to the other side, but sometimes, you know, under pressure of a trial, things happen and you forget. All right, any questions, comments? Um, have a look in the Commonwealth Jurisdiction Section 46 of the Evidence Act, which deals specifically with that question of asking the court for leave to recall to recall witnesses um, in dealing with the Brown and Dunn issue. Let's move on. Now, <clears throat> there's a distinction between credit and credibility. And there's a general finality rule in relation to collateral issues that go to someone's credit. A person may be discreditable um, because of the, you know, who they are, um, or a person may simply lack credibility because of the circumstances they're in. So you might have someone who's an entirely honest, law-abiding uh, citizen who lacks credibility because they couldn't see very well, they couldn't hear very well, um, they were subject to uh, the effects of medication on the day. So completely honest witnesses, but by attacking those aspects, you may be able to question their credibility as giving evidence in a particular case. You're not, you're not attacking their character. So there's a difference when we talk about credit and credibility, really that comes down to someone's character. And sometimes there's a bit of a crossover. So have a look at the case of R against Sadler. 2008, 20 Victorian reports, Victoria report 69. Um, Sadler was convicted of some charges involving physical violence against his de facto. The court held that defence counsel should have been allowed to cross-examine the complainant in relation to her alleged drug addiction. Now, whilst the court acknowledged that may go to the person's character, at the same time, it was greatly relevant to the complainant's credibility 
as a witness, because if that person was drug addicted and affected by drugs at the time, that may weaken less, less weight on that person's evidence. So you can see that sometimes there's a crossover between character, which is credit, and credibility of the witness because of their circumstances. So I mentioned briefly the finality rule, which basically says we've got to put a stop to having this lengthy line of potential witnesses lining up to say um, attacking someone's credit um, in circumstances where it's a collateral issue. There are some exceptions. Uh, again, I think they're in the textbook, but the five general common law exceptions to the finality rule are previous inconsistent statements, criminal history, bias, the witness's reputation for lack of veracity, or physical and mental incapacity. Also remember that there are some statutory provisions in relation to cross-examination as to credit. I've already mentioned sections 21, Queensland and 41 Commonwealth that deal with this issue of improper questions. So always a good go-to argument, sections 21 or 41, as the case may be. But look specifically at section 20 of the Queensland Act that deals with the issue of cross-examination as to credit. And put simply, the court may disallow a question as to credit in cross-examination if the court considers an admission of the question's truth would not materially impair confidence in the reliability of the witness's evidence. So essentially what we're saying is that sometimes the court's patience for questions that relate to credit may be tested to the point where the court will disallow certain questions. In the common law sphere, have a look at sections 106 and importantly, section 102, where there is, Michael says, exactly right. So no death by a thousand cuts. Exactly. That's a really good way of putting it, Michael. I like that. Section 102 of the Commonwealth Act says that credibility evidence about a witness is not admissible. So they kind of just said, we're going to really stomp on this finality rule. We're going to make it such that um, uh, credibility evidence per se is not admissible. So have a look at that sections from 102 through to probably about 110 would be relevant. Okay, um, just a quick note on re-examination. You weren't examined on this in the first assessment, but if you were examined on re, uh, re if you were to be examined on re-examination, really here's the important thing: that any questions in re-examination must arise out of the cross-examination. It's not an opportunity for counsel to raise matters that counsel forgot to put witnesses during evidence in chief. So there are limits on re-examination. Uh, that's the general rule, but also look at section 39 of the Commonwealth jurisdiction in relation to limitations on re-examination. You're doing well. I know there's a lot of content. Um, another area which seems to crop up quite often in examination questions is in relation to special witnesses. And when we talk about special witnesses, probably the most important category is affected children. From a Queensland perspective, the starting point is section 21A of the Evidence Act. So you need to know what is meant by a special witness. You'll need to know what allowance a special witness has. And you'll need to understand some of the procedural aspects that relate to the giving of evidence by special witnesses. So firstly, a special witness is someone who is entitled to give evidence in a less intimidating arena than applies for, for want of better of a term, an average witness. So for example, a child under 16 or a person with mental, intellectual or physical impairment might be regarded as a disadvantaged person 
and therefore entitled to give their evidence in a special way. Now, when it comes to affected children, which I said is probably the most important subcategory, have a look at section 21AD, which deals with the meaning of a child because it's under 16, but in certain circumstances. And I mentioned also the procedural aspects and how things change from a practical perspective. So when it comes to affected children, the less intimidating forum that I mentioned that would be available to them is evidenced in section 21AK of the Evidence Act, which essentially requires the videotaping of the affected child's evidence. And we call this a pre-record. So in practice, what happens is this. If you have, for example, evidence which is to be provided by a complainant child in relation to a sexual assault matter, then the evidence of that child is pre-recorded. We don't have the jury. Um, we have a closed court. The child presents the evidence, which is normally in the, in the form of a, um, of a, a videotape uh, interview initially and supplemented by questions uh, and answers by prosecution. And then we have questions um, by way of cross-examination from, from defence counsel. Now, all of that is pre-recorded. Once the trial starts, so that is actually the start of the trial, but later, at a later time, the jury is impanelled and prosecution as part of its case will then show the, the recording, the video recording, in open, or, sorry, in closed court, but the jury will then get to see that. So in other words, the child has given his or her evidence, but in a forum which is safe. Um, and in fact, the child doesn't even come into the courtroom. The child will be in a separate room with a support person and everything is done by, by, um, by audiovisual means. So this taping of the audiovisual pre-record is then presented to the jury normally at an early stage in the trial of the matter. Does that all make sense? So you need to know section 21A, you need to know section 21AK, you need to know about the pre-record process, and I'd also have a look at section 93A um, of the, um, oh gosh, 93A. I'll come back to that, whether it's uh, just a mental blank, whether it's um, in the Criminal Code or the Evidence Act, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. I should know that so well. But we just we just become used to saying the uh, numbers. So yes, Michael. A statement made before proceeding by a child or person with an impairment of the mind. That's it? 93. Yes. Oh, okay, that's 93. Is it the Evidence Act? Correct, Queensland. All oh, right, okay, great. So it is in the Evidence Act. For some reason, I started to think of it. Uh, I know what I was thinking about. Um, in the Criminal Code, part of the procedure for um, preliminary trial matters is Section 590, capital A, of the Criminal Code. That deals with more procedural issues. Okay, you've been really patient. How have we gone so far? Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to press on a little further, if you don't mind. And we'll start talking about documentary and real evidence. So real evidence, of course, is some form of material object. You know, when we talk about material evidence, we always talk about a knife. You know, here's, here's the knife, here's the murder weapon. That's real evidence, isn't it? And documents, of course, we think of as pieces of paper. But I'm sure by now that you're aware that Schedule 3 of the Queensland Act, which is part of the dictionary, provides that documents are much more than pieces of paper. They include pieces of paper, documents in writing, but they're also books and maps and plans and photographs or even electronic digital material. So there's a question here. Um, just before we do, where is there authoritative material as to limitations of oral evidence? So I'm not quite sure what that means, Sarah. My apologies. Do you want to unmute the microphone or elaborate? Yeah, so um, in the study guide for oral evidence, which was back a bit, um, 
it talks about limitations of oral evidence like, you know, memory or perception and stuff like that. Um, and I was wondering around thinking to myself, these are something to keep in mind when you're coming to presentations for oral evidence missions and stuff like that. Um, but <clears throat> I'm not sure if there's an authority that goes with that limitation, like you can go, you know, there's this shows that perception can be mistaken. No, no, there's not. No, they're, they're really just general principles. And in a way, they're pretty much common sense, aren't they? Um, so that when you're seeking to attack the um, quality of evidence by a witness, what you're really looking to do is question their ability to remember over a period of time, their ability to take everything in, particularly if it's um, in a quick, uh, quick, short environment, um, and, and really just attack those general problems associated with the giving of oral evidence that relate to people's abilities to perceive and then remember and communicate. So no authorities as such, but they're just general principles. I hope that answers your question, Sarah. Okay, that's good. All right, so um, let's move on and just talk about hearsay for a moment. So hearsay, of course, is an out-of-court statement made expressly or impliedly in relation to an assertion claimed to be true. The important point there is out-of-court statement. So this kind of feeds into the oral evidence that it's the evidence under oath that is really important. So generally speaking, hearsay evidence, out-of-court statements, is not admissible. But again, we have many exceptions to that. And indeed, it's probably easier to say that the exceptions form the, by, by far the bulk of the, any discussions around the provision of hearsay evidence. So um, when you're looking at hearsay evidence, um, we, one of the things we need to consider is documentary evidence. And uh, admissions of out-of-court statements by a child, 93A, which is the Evidence Act. Thank you, Michael, for filing that. Uh, so, or DNA evidence by a certificate or Section 95 is also important. So an exception to this general hearsay rule relates to admissions of documents and out-of-court statements in certain circumstances. So do have a look at Sections 92 through to 95A of the Queensland Act and good, uh, get a, a good grounding of that, where it applies and where it doesn't apply. Now that might be a good place to stop for this evening and we'll continue next week with those discussions. In the meantime, as I mentioned at the start of um, tonight's session, please start to put together some model answers for yourself in relation to what you think might be on the examination. Now you might say, well, I don't know what's on the examination. There might be a thousand, there might be a hundred different topics. So my response is, this is cruel. Well, that's good. Just write a hundred model answers for yourself. It's all good fun. Um, and, and I'm sure you can produce that very quickly and um, efficiently. You can write them out in full or you can make dot points or you can write flow charts or something that will help you generally. Okay, on that note, on that sober note, <laughs> we'll end for this evening. Thank you again for your attendance and staying with me. Um, we'll see you next week. All the very best. Bye then. <laughs>